Uh, please share what you believe are the keys to male leadership in the modern household. Uh, first and foremost, the most revolutionary act a black man can do right now is to lead a black family. And to I, um, when you're to I, when you're vetting your circle, I like to work with family man because it shows me that you have a history of being able to accomplish something of a magnitude. You're reliable because to maintain a family, you have to have certain things that are uh, reliable. So the thing I, I've been preaching on my channel is that you have to first and foremost have a connection with the Almighty. Um, you, whatever, whatever, whatever that is, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Buddhist, you have to be centered from a higher power. Why? You have to be accountable to something higher than yourself because yourself will always let yourself down if you're just there because we're human, we're the flesh. So we have to have an anchor that's higher than ourselves. Second, when you seek the Almighty and all the Almighty's righteousness, then you have to identify what is your purpose? What is it that you can do to use your unique skill or talent to ser in service of that higher power to make the world a better place? Why is that important? Because as a man leading a family, you are called to lead. If you do not have a clear compass of what you're trying to do for yourself in service to your creator, how can you lead somebody else? How can you ask a young lady to follow you blindly when you even yourself don't know what you're doing and where you're going. That's a recipe for disaster. And this is what has happened to many of our brethren. Because this girl, as the prophet said, had a big butt and a smile, you go follow this woman and you create life. You know what I mean? But you had no plan other than the big butt and the smile made you feel happy within that moment. Now we have these families with no direction it's chaos. There's no lion guarding the pride. We have an epidemic of child molestation, trauma uh, at record highs because there's no defense. So as a bridging, you have to overstand that if you're serious about black liberation, the biggest contribution that you can have is to maintain, protect, provide for a black family. And to do that, you have to be crystal clear. I tell young brethren, spend your 20s identifying that purpose, fulfilling that purpose. The next thing is that you have to identify what is the economics of my purpose. This is the key, because in the Pan-African movement, we've made poverty a badge of honor. The more poor you are is the more righteous you are, because I don't get money and think. I've had people say, look at the Ross, I do YouTube and I talk about, you know. And I'm saying, so brethren, you know his majesty was a businessman. Rastafari was never conceived as a poverty child. So, you know, these are the false concepts. And that is um, something that I am very clear um, in my ecosystem model that I advocate for. Failure is a part of the process. We have to train ourselves in his majesty. I have been doing a series on leadership and I go to the University College of Addis Ababa speech his majesty gives a treatise on leadership, page 12 of the selected speeches. I'm the reading Ras, so I'm going to give them the citation. The, the leadership, you know, he says a leader must train himself out of a fear of failure because that's part of the process. Does a baby come out the womb and start run up and down? The baby have to crawl, the baby fall down, the baby, um, you know, before it can walk. So anything we do, failure, we got to allocate a time for failure, and this is why, again, practice and theory, that's the, th the theme of this interview. The theoretical people have the most chat because on the sideline, you can, everything works, you know what I mean? Once you, you're just criticizing what a man is doing. Everything sounds good, and when you try to implement and you reach that roadblock and you have to do this and do that, I put on events, and a lot of time people will criticize. They don't know what you had to go through to get that done. Why are you working with this person? Because this person was going to do what I said that needed to be done. And this person, you might like them, but they're not coming through. So it's either I'm not going to do the event uh, or I'm going to do it with someone who can fulfill the obligation. So as a, 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 a man, you know what I mean? You have to 
have that integrity to be able to lead. And again, this comes down to your purpose, um, having that anchor so that you can draw from because mental health is, is serious. And the burden of leading a family for a black male right now is unprecedented because you're oftentimes, you can't unload on your woman. You know, a man, um, that's not the woman's purpose. And I'm not saying you can't consult, but you can't dump on them. So you have to find other outlets, whether it's prayer, exercise, a therapist. Um, but as a man, you have to really manage your mental health. And you have to, and, and part of that is, again, having that connection to the higher power and being very clear in terms of what it is you are doing to serve that creator by utilizing your innate passion. That means what would you be doing even if you weren't being paid? Now, how can I monetize? How can I find the economics? Establishing an economic base before you bring the woman into the picture is critical, and this is where we fail because instant gratification. Your light is going to draw women to you. That doesn't mean you have to sleep with them and bring life into the, the world. We have a thing called de-discipline. You know, dick discipline. I don't know how graphic we can go, but you know what I mean? Dick discipline, which is critical because who you procreate with will shift the entire reality of your world if you choose the wrong person. Um, I'm very big advocate on uh, vetting your people that you allow into your intimate space thoroughly. Um, so the one night stand in, in I and I world don't exist because you can't get enough information on a person in a one night scenario. I go to the dance and me and a sister in rent a tile and the two are we are bubble and our vibes are going and whisper in our ears and you know, stop it right there, brethren. Don't bother with it because guess what happened? That chemistry might only be for that night. That sister may have a completely different worldview. But when you deposit that seed of life in that cistern that night there because you couldn't find a condom and the vibes it's still higher. You know what I mean? And a life is created. Now guess what? You have something that can't work. Cistern gone deso, you gone deso, cistern baby, father um, from another family, his brother, uncle so and so is with your youth now. Things go on and you, you traumatize, confusion. You understand the lion is not there, the male lion is not there for govern his pride land, his territory. You know what I mean? And this is how we have to think about it. So everything is about legacy, preservation of seed. And let me just elaborate more. Right now is Armageddon time. So we saw what happened in the pandemic. If you had chosen wrongly in that pandemic, judgment, because you were locked down with someone. Uh, and it's crucial because, again, this is the revolution. Your family is the first government. You are the king and, uh, uh, and your house is the palace. So if your government internally is not good, you know, the trauma response is flight or fight. Fight or flight. So when we try to build institutions and everybody walk away from the table, that's a trauma response when we get to a, a bump in the road. And it's because of people's home upbringing. They avoid that conflict instead of working through it, which is a natural part of any organization building. So this is why we have so few black institutions, because we operate from that trauma response. Or we fight. You look at a lot of black institutions, the infighting. Other uh, races, it's not that they love each other to the, the highest extent but it's that they overstand the bigger picture. They're able to work through conflict, through a system, and get the ultimate objective done. And this is coming from what? Broken family structure. So we can't even build this Edenic um, alternative to Babylon, this Zion on earth that Rastafari achieved. This is why so much of my content become family content, because I realize we can talk about the history all day, we can talk about what we want to do all day. If we don't have stable people to execute this or to live in this new reality, the same Babylon corruption is going to manifest once again because Babylon comes out of that corruption. It comes out of that dysfunction of the family structure. It comes out of that hurt, of that, that abuse. These are all of the things that we hate about Babylon. It is a response to a way of life, and we have to restore that original way of life, which is why Haile Selassie, being crowned with his empress at the same time is so revolutionary. His empress was pregnant at the time. So when you see that coronation picture, man, woman, and child, 
you know, the children surrounding the throne as well for added effect. That Trinity is what we have to advocate for and we have to preserve with our lives. So this is what I want to kind of redefine because we had people like Robert Nestor Marley, the great, but you know, the liberty that he had was a lot of women. And then we had the great King Solomon, liberty had, and these are two examples that a lot of virgin used to justify having a lot of baby mothers or a lot of women around. Number one, I, I, I'm big up to Dr. Aini Naya Bingi Elder, polygamy is a rich man lifestyle. So if you can be in that small 1% of the 1% that can afford to manage all of these households, don't bother with it. And there's a methodology and a culture that comes with polygamy. It's not this baby mother and I know about that baby mother there. And you know, oftentimes the wife is the one that's choosing the other wives and things. So there's a culture around that, so we can't use that. Secondly, His Majesty example with Empress Menin was a monogamous relationship. Um, one man, one woman, the children all under one roof. This is the standard that we are really trying to identify for Rastafari, Bridgen and Sistrin. And the generations that came before us did not have that standard. And I've seen, you know, because I've had to deal with, you know, fundraising from multiple elders that pass away and their children are not involved because they weren't in their children's life to that full extent. And, you know, the community ends up having to bear the burden and, and these things that happen from that spreading of the seed widely, which sounded good in theory. But in practice, again, that trauma is dispersed because there's resentment from the children who didn't grow up with a father in the household. Yes, you might have go to see them. Yes, you might have bought them a ear Jordan for their eighth birthday and you, you remember that fondly, how them did smile. But that one Jordan's where you buy them can make up for all of the time that you were not present. And a lot of us in the Caribbean, that's our mentality. We buy them some nice things and we're there for them sometime. But that doesn't take away a child's hurt from not being there with a father in the home. So we want to, my generation in particular, the Bridgen I see prospering right now are the Bridgen that have their queen and their families under one roof and that are, their queens are helping them to build. Um, I live that way and I want to encourage my Bridgen them to adapt this as the Rastafari standard moving forward because to build a strong nation, we have to start with strong communities. To build a strong community, it starts with strong black families.